Sorry, I was fielding calls from both of the other agents that are not on the meeting right now. No worries, no worries. Lawrence, Michael, if uh, you have questions along the way, I will be, I'll pause every once in a while. And if there's something in the chat box, I can take one or two questions. Or... Thank you, thank you. So I will have, um, I have Donna uh, monitoring that. So she okay. will, she will um, uh, let you know, but thank you Great. for that. I appreciate that. And I apologize, Lawrence, Michael, I missed the uh, intro here. Is there anything you wanted me to do um, by way of introduction or anything? Oh, no, uh, I will introduce everybody. Um, just, yeah, shout out, hello is fine with me. Okay. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Oh, and welcome, uh, Mr. Cross. Uh, I'm one of the staff members here at SEMA. Oh, sorry, Zeb. Yes, I, I did introduce you, did not realizing you weren't there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Disembodied uh, <laughs> Zoom head. I'll continue to drink my novelty sized protein shake. <laughs> Sounds good. No, oh, it is a protein shake. What's the, what's the air quotes? This is a pro <laughs> what, what is novel size? Oh, no. It's just you can relax in this cup. I don't know if you can see it here. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> it's like the ones you get at the movie theater, you know? Ah. The, cup, the cup comes with wheels on it. <laughs> <laughs> and those learning. Good, good morning, everybody. So we will start in one minute, in about one minute. Uh, thank you for being here early. You get to see the board banter. Terry, as you can see, the SEMA board is quite shy. <laughs> yeah, we're all introverts and don't yes. talk. <laughs> A bunch of shrinking violets around here. <laughs> shrinking violet. That's a good one. Yeah. Zeb, can I also have you monitor uh, members who are coming in? Make sure to admit them. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I don't know if somebody is assigned doing that, but I'm doing that. But if somebody could also. What was the thing? Make sure they're what? Uh, just to make sure to admit members who are coming in. Oh, and in the uh, lobby. mute myself unless you call on me as well. Sounds good. Thank you. I just could do the same. I'd be obliged. And we are recording as a reminder. Thank you. Okay. And I've got time at noon. So we'll, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good noon, everybody. <laughs> it is 12 <laughs> noon. Uh, uh, um, on behalf of SEMA Executive Board and the SEMA Professional Development Committee, um, I'm happy to welcome you to our summer SEMA uh, event, Collective Trauma and Resiliency with Terry L. Cross. I'm Lawrence Michael C. Arias, and I'm so honored to be your elected SEMA Executive Board Vice President and Chair of the SEMA Professional Development Committee. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to first take a few moments to introduce the rest of the team. Uh, First, you know them as tireless advocates for our members, our hardworking Zeb Feldman. Hello. Do you want us to unmute and say anything? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. If you could just shout out and say hi. Hi, Zeb Feldman here. If you're here. Um, Adam Cole. I don't remember seeing Adam. He's at BMC right now. That's right. That's right. Um, Lauren Sue. Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us. And Jonathan Brown. I'd also like to member uh, to introduce uh, members of the executive board, uh, our president Dolores Morales. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our senior vice president Carla Collins. Hi everyone. Thank you. Our uh, treasurer Jim Piazza. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining. It's great to have you here. Our secretary Donna Menzimer. Hello everyone. Our members at large uh, Mary Beth Rogers. Hello. Robin Rivas Romano. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, don't didn't see them. Jesse Castaneda and Lori Romero. Laura Romero, are you here? No. Okay. Um, so uh, I'd also like to introduce the members of the SEMA Professional Development Committee, which includes myself as chair. You've already met Dolores, Donna, and Robin, but also the following members: uh, Teresa Chigoya. Are you here to say hello? 
uh, also Vihar Patel and Will Quintero. <coughs> Um, a really quick, uh, just uh, a housekeeping. If you haven't already done so for this for this session, uh, if you kindly please make sure to log in with your full name. So if you do have any questions, we can respond promptly to you. You can also rename yourself by right clicking on your name on your picture or video. Um, please be advised that uh, questions submitted by unknown users will not be considered. Um, and also in consideration for our speaker, kindly please make sure to keep yourself on mute. Um, now I'd like to turn this over to our committee member and e-board secretary, Donna Menzerberg, to introduce our keynote speaker, Donna. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Donna Menzerberg, I am your secretary, and I am so proud to be uh, an elected person and part of a union that represents such hardworking, passionate, caring, collaborative managers. Um, our union over the past several years because of COVID has been trying to identify a speaker who understands collective trauma and can resonate with our peers and who can provide a different light to this endemic that has become our new normal. Well, we've been very unsuccessful. And then lo and behold, I go to Oregon Tech. I go to my nephew's uh, graduation ceremony uh, who is graduating with his degree in engineering. And we have this amazing speaker who talks about collective trauma. My mother and my sister and I were sitting there with our jaws open, not expecting this as a commencement speaker, and were enthralled. And after his speech, we felt full again. And uh, so I asked our professional development committee to um, consider bringing Terry Cross in to speak to our members. So just a little bit about Terry Cross. He works uh, through uh, with the National Indian Child Welfare Association, and he is part of uh, the Seneca Nation. So Terry, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I do have a slide deck to share with people this morning. So I'm just going to share my screen. And uh, my style and presentation is to stop every few slides and just take a question or so, um, just uh, so we stay grounded in the um, content. I will go through the first part pretty quickly uh, because I just want to share with you the, the, um, the, uh, the concepts behind this idea of uh, intentional resilience. Um, let's uh, look at what you might expect today. I'm going to do uh, an overview of an indigenous worldview perspective on wellness, and um, it it helps uh, organize the thinking here. And uh, it's it's hard for me to do it otherwise because I'm a citizen of the Seneca Nation, a, a part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So I grew up in Western New York State, but I've been in Oregon for many years. I'm going to talk about the difference between stress and trauma and how they're related to one another, some uh, quick definitions of trauma, and then dig, uh, go deeper into the idea of collective trauma, and then look at strategies for intentional resilience. So uh, first, um, intentional means we do it on purpose. And secondly, resilience means the capacity to re recover quickly or to have a toughness or be able to spring back. So intentional resilience really refers to having to actively plan and engage in a holistic personalized strategy to, to promote balance and to mitigate the stresses that we face. So uh, I, I have to ground this uh, in the comparison of two worldviews. Western European American thought is grounded in a linear worldview. It understands human behavior and our human situation in a, a series of cause and effect relationships. The primary way of looking at change and problem solving is to try to understand the cause uh, and then bring about a new effect and change that cause. And all of you are probably familiar with the linear theory of change. And this is going to be the probably the simplest uh, depiction of a theory of change that you'll ever see. Given a particular situation, if we do something about it, this will happen. Um, if you have any uh, written grant proposals or such, uh, you'll see this laid out in great huge charts. Um, but this is a very simplified version. Um, but 
uh, I want you to consider an alternative that uh, that culture matters with the way people organize their thinking about health and wellness. And so in the indigenous world, um, people tend to organize their thinking around uh, health and wellness or problem solving through a, ba a, a balance around the four quadrant circle of mind, body, spirit, and context. Um, and I, this is a indigenous approach to understanding life and wellness. It's a, this is a composite of indigenous peace, uh, teachings from many different places in not only the in North America, but across the world. And it's, uh, it includes the concepts of the medicine wheel, but I'm always careful to say it's not, we're not uh, depicting the medicine wheel of any one tribal group. Um, and at the National Indian Child Welfare Association, we've developed this into a practice model, a guide for tribal child welfare and mental health practices, where we're really looking at helping restore the balance of our communities. And um, so this four quadrant circle represents um, our concepts of health and, uh, and our uh, wellness. So in the context quadrant, we include things like culture and community and work and uh, family, peers, the economic environment, uh, social history that we have. And what I uh, always say is that what I can put up here are representative examples of things that might be considered to be included here. And because this circle includes all of our human experience, um, it's impossible to list, uh, to even list a portion um, of what's here. These are these are the highlights that I uh, depict. In the mind quadrant, this, our thought process, our judgment, uh, the way that we put our thoughts together, the uh, things like self-esteem and memory and emotions. Um, these are all um, things that we consider our mental, uh, mental emotional uh, processes. And um, we're, we engage the world by trying to make sense of it. And we make sense of it through our ability to think. Uh, in the body, uh, we're, uh, some of the things that we might consider is biochemistry and genetics and the, our uh, states, uh, what health we're in, uh, states of rest and sleep and nutrition, uh, substance use, and it's all kinds of things might be included here. Um, then in the spirit quadrant, what I refer to is in, as the innate positive, the innate negative, the learned positive, and the learned negative. And I'll just start very quickly with the learned positive, the, the things we learn to do in various spiritual disciplines to evoke positive spiritual outcomes, things like prayer and ritual and ceremony and uh, the learned negatives are the things that we learn to do that mess us up spiritually, and they usually show up in our spiritual teachings as the things we shouldn't do, like gossip and covetousness and uh, bearing false witness, other, other kinds of things that we learn to do, um, but um, they'll mess us up if, if we uh, if we behave that way. What we say in, in our tribal communities is what goes around comes around. The innate uh, positive are those spiritual forces that help us no matter what we understand or how we conceptualize that uh, can be thought of as uh, grace, uh, the Christ-like, can be uh, ancestral intervention, can be positive karma or good luck or good fortune. Uh, so just things that help us that we, uh, that are Perhaps uh, in some senses serendipitous, others seem quite intentional. The innate negative or the flip is the flip side of that. Uh, things that bother us, uh, that um, bad things happen to good people. Um, we don't have a good understanding of all of this functions. And so we put it all in the category of faith. So this quadrant is not about religion so much as it is about the human experience of, uh, of our spiritual natures and uh, then uh, how it, it impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think I will stop there uh, and let quest come take a question or two. This is 
um, this worldview is very fluid. Um, it's a, in a cyclical process, and every aspect of life is related to every other aspect. And um, when you're uh, working in this way to help people, you don't have to aim the services at the problem. You aim the services at the at the balance around the circle. So the underlying question is not uh, what's wrong with you, but how can we restore balance? Uh, any questions or thoughts about that? Just before I jump back in here, and feel free to put anything in the chat box. Right now, there are no questions in the chat, but I will. I will definitely. Uh, if anyone does have one, just pop it in there, and I can go ahead and read it to Terry. Cool. Well, I will jump back in. I will be pausing along the way. Um, as we have this discussion going forward. So you can use this relational worldview model as a roadmap to resilience, because we can intentionally shift the balance around this circle. We actually do it all the time. We learn in biology about homeostasis. When you're hungry, you eat. When you're tired, you sleep. Um, when you feel lonely, you find people to be with. Um, so we're always constantly balancing and rebalancing this circle. Um, and uh, in our uh, in our tribal teachings, in my turn, adversity is a normal part of life. It comes and goes. It comes in cycles. And we're built to find balance. We're built. Uh, we're designed as human beings to be able to um, come in and out of adversity and to find the balance that we need. However, the greater the stress or the more severe the trauma, the more intentional we have to be about this process. So let's look at stress versus trauma. Uh, stress is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension that results from a demanding circumstance or some, some adversity. And trauma uh, has a deeply disturbing or it's a, di a distressing uh, experience. And it usually has an association with some deep emotional shock or some emotional wounding. Now, you hear the, the phrase, post-traumatic stress. Um, this is really about a process where, where stress can become uh, traumatic. Um, that uh, the, uh, the stress is, um, it's an, um, this uh, emotionally shocking or wounding experience resulting from long-term um, stress uh, stress environment. That um, that stressful environment uh, can uh, can the stress can become traumatic when it's unmitigated or unmanaged. In other words, uh, if you're not doing anything about it or paying attention to it, or there's there's no buffer, there's no way uh, in um, in our tribal communities, we talk uh, about uh, the racism as being like walking into the wind every day. Uh, and how do you act when you walk into the wind? You keep your head down, uh, you push forward, you have to keep your eyes closed and um, you get very tired. Uh, if you don't have a place to get in out of the wind, um, it can be very depleting to be in that environment. So uh, we seek out places to get in out of the wind, which is with our families or with our community or in our ceremonies or in our rituals. Uh, and so that's what I mean about it being, um, there's, there's uh, unmitigated stress uh, can become traumatic. Chronic, oppressive, or dehumanizing stress uh, can become traumatic. When, uh, when stress becomes internalized and it becomes toxic to relationships, um, we take it in and it starts to make us sick 
um, both physically, but also in the way that we interact with people. So if we start using words that hurt, and um, if we start um, responding to people with uh, a degree of emotion that doesn't belong to them, and that's coming from that stressed out state, um, it can even um, hurt our uh, health through uh, creating tension in our body, and it can uh, challenge our spiritual nature by uh, sometimes alienating us from the very things that could be helpful. Uh, stress can become traumatic when it triggers some historical trauma, uh, either historical trauma that's collective as a people or your own personal unresolved grief or loss or trauma. And in particularly in this uh, discussion today, stress can become traumatic when it's collective. And I'm gonna, again, before I dive, take a deeper dive into the collective uh, nature of trauma, I want to uh, pause here and see if there's any questions. And I'm gonna drop out of this mode for just a second and um, take us to look at the, um, uh, the slide sorter mode. So you can get a look at a few of the slides. Um, and I'll make this, you can see a handful of these slides. Thoughts or comments or questions about the slides that I've just covered. We have uh, Zeb Feldman has one. Zeb, yes. would you like to go? Do so you want me to ahead. put it in chat or do you want me to unmute? No, you can go ahead since there's, an, I don't have any in chat, so go yeah. ahead. And okay, yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Terry, Mr. Cross. Um, there, you, you mentioned that trauma is collective and that we seek out individuals, you know, when we're lonely or when we need to talk about something. Do you find it that, that when we have a trauma, or a collective trauma, is it best to go to someone who's experienced that very same trauma? Or do you find that it's better to go to someone that's outside of that circle? Well, I, um, I certainly believe in support groups um, uh, and the power of people coming together who understand the same issue. I think I'm, though I'm in this case, uh, in terms of intentional resilience, I'm talking about making sure that we don't isolate ourselves. Um, and the, your question implies that linear model that I was uh, uh, talking about in the first few slides. If this, in, in the case of this, if we do this, this will happen. Um, so the, the thinking, and that, and that would be the model of going to a support group on a particular topic. And certainly uh, a viable um, uh, process and, and a good intervention However, um, on a more holistic level, uh, just making sure that we're staying in touch with people who, uh, with whose relationships fill us up, give us respite, uh, feed us emotionally, sometimes physically. Uh, you know, if we're spending time with family or friends, having good food. Um, so part of what the this the importance of the intentional resilience is it isn't doing any one thing in any one of these quadrants it's doing something in every quadrant and paying attention to it so in other words it it isn't uh, going and having dinner with your friends or a good night out isn't the the um, silver bullet to you know to uh, take care of traumatic stress but it can help uh, you be in a position, um, in a more balanced position to, to uh, mitigate the negative impacts and perhaps even then have the emotional energy to pick up the phone and find the support group. Um, that's, so I'm, I'm talking about an approach that's, that's uh, holistic and spread around the entire circle. Does that make sense? Good. Yeah, it does. And I see there's another question. So um, yeah, and I get it, right? We 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 all have, hopefully, well, maybe not all of us, many of us have nu nourishing and robust social uh, circles that 
can help us at any given time. I guess my question was more oriented towards people who maybe don't have that yeah. are reaching out on a particular topic. But I, I think you answered it, and thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, keep in mind too that people who are introverted get their batteries cha charged by spending time alone. So um, you very well may, may need to have a couple of days out in nature all by yourself to have the energy to solve the problem. So getting to know yourself is part of this intentional resilience process. Thank you, Zach. Okay, so we do have a question that said, how do we align a relational worldview when we're working in a very linear model? Ah, yes, well, uh, it's a dilemma that uh, indigenous people face all of the time and, uh, and it can be quite daunting. Um, I see it as um, having a personal plan. Um, we're gonna talk about that in, in a few minutes. Um, that you uh, that you understand your own sense of balance in the world so that you can uh, live intentionally. Most of us do it unconsciously. Um, and some of us, if you if you can look at what keeps you healthy uh, rather than uh, treats you when you're sick, uh, you'll see that it's a much more diverse approach. Uh, uh, a set of circumstances. Um, and we, uh, in, in a uh, living in a linear world kind of pulls us off of the track uh, very frequently. Um, and it's by um, planning the small things. So paying, so uh, some of you may have, may be familiar with the uh, management literature of Stephen Covey, for example. Um, and uh, Covey in his Seven Habits literature and his First Things First uh, writings uh, talks about making sure that you uh, sharpen the saw. Um, in other words, take time to take care of yourself every single week and that you put that into your planner, um, that you figure out what the most important things are in your life, um, your your family, uh, including your your recreational uh, needs, uh, your physical wellness needs, and that you actually put that into your calendar day to day. Um, you schedule a walk, or you schedule a phone call, um, or you uh, schedule uh, reading what Covey referred to as wisdom literature. So you're feeding your spirit, you're taking care of your body, you're feeding your, your physical, uh, your social relationships. Um, and by doing all of those things, he calls it sharpening the saw. In other words, you, uh, be, uh, you stay sharp uh, to do your work uh, in that linear realm by making sure you're paying attention to your, uh, to taking care of yourselves. And I'm, and I'm, so there's, uh, you can, uh, Covey, um, his approach was uh, was certainly out of a, a linear worldview. Um, and so my, you know, my orientation to the relational just helps me think about that as, as uh, being very, being intentional and being balanced around paying attention to all of those aspects of our human experience. Great question. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump back in. I, um, uh, Donna, do, uh, were there other questions? Can, can you might no. hold them? No, okay. that was actually the last one. Great. Okay. And I'm going to go back to, there we go. Let's look more deeply at the um, issue of um, the, the types of trauma, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into the collective trauma. So um, historical trauma or in, uh, intergenerational trauma that's uh, unresolved, this, uh, these are ex uh, traumas that are expected, experienced collectively that tend to get handed down from generation to generation. Uh, pervasive losses, uh, things like uh, you know, cultures that have experienced genocide, uh, colonization, um, and other uh, collective experiences and some uh, uh, things like refugee uh, experiences, war experiences, all 
can have historical intergenerational aspects to them that tend to last for several uh, generations. There can be, uh, of course, current trauma, any kind of loss in our lives, uh, a loss of a, a someone who is dear to us or or who we have uh, a close relationship with or conflicted relationship with either. Uh, it, and any experiences that are life-threatening um, certainly uh, can be considered as traumatic experiences. Um, there's a notion of complex trauma where you get multiple layers uh, of current trauma and historical trauma and some of it's personal and some of it's bystander. So it gets to be a layer upon layer of trauma that tr uh, where that trauma gets triggered throughout those various layers. Um, personal trauma, um, as, uh, we can think of things like being the, the victim of violence um, from, uh, uh, or other uh, some other loss or or emotional uh, fear or wounding, some bystander trauma. We can uh, when we see um, trauma, uh, some traumatic event when we witness violence, when we witness an accident or something like that, where uh, where we tend not to uh, get the help that we need because it's something that we observed rather than being involved in it, um, it can, can continue to bother us. Um, chronic trauma like poverty or discrimination or racism. I, I mentioned the native experience of feeling sometimes in the world like we're walking into the wind at every moment. And it, it uh, takes a toll on your well-being, your sense of, of safety. Um, and then uh, the sense of uh, secondary trauma. If you're a helper, um, if you're a supervisor who is supervising people who are dealing in areas of trauma all of the time, um, and if you're hearing stories about people's trauma as a counselor, as a therapist, uh, you can be experiencing vicarious trauma. And uh, that you know, we we have clinical supervision. I'm a licensed clinical supervisor, a social worker, and I've both received and provide clinical supervision um, because it's so important uh, when we're dealing with other people's traumas that we uh, not take it on ourselves. So, um, and then this topic of of collective trauma, and this. Um, Collective trauma um, is, is a widely shared adverse experience that's deeply distressing. Um, and it usually is a series of events uh, affecting people in commonality. Uh, there are often feelings of betrayal or vulnerability or uncertainty like uh, we, uh, in the because because it's a series of events, uh, usually then we're uh, we don't know what's coming next, and every new threat uh, is layered on the collective experience that came before it, and we may feel a threatened autonomy. In other words, you lose your personal choice because so much is happening around you and happening to you. It seems that you've uh, there's no place to go to get out of the wind, no place to go uh, to um, to recover um, from the constant um, uh, stresses of this uh, collect these collective experiences. Another aspect of collective trauma that uh, can be quite troubling to people is, is the that the confidence in the institutions of society to mitigate the threat can be shaken. And I think we're seeing this throughout the country today, the, the fear that the, the institutions of society, uh, governmental institutions, uh, faith institutions, uh, you know, um, educational institutions that should be mitigating the threat um, are uh, insufficient um, to meet the threat to the point where people don't feel threatened and some will even feel um, threatened 
um, by the attempts of the institutions of society to mitigate the threat. Um, it it uh, complex interplay with that feeling of the threatened autonomy and vulnerability. And, it, and it used, as we see it in our societies, currently manifested in this uh, a uh, rebellion or a, a rejection um, of the, the very things that are intended to, uh, to help. And, uh, this loss of sense of control and personal agency or economic viability, um, you see uh, this in, uh, in um, collective trauma associated with natural disasters, whether it's uh, floods or wildfires or earthquakes or, um, or and now this um, our pandemic. These are areas where people um, lose um, a lot of their ability to manage, to mitigate the, the, uh, the stresses, uh, the traumas, because they're in such a position that they're, there's the, the situations are so complex that they're overwhelming personal um, choice as well as economic uh, viability, and it's hard to know what's coming next. And for some, it can even be a spiritual crisis, a test of faith of why do why do bad things happen to good people? And I think once again, I think we're doing good on time. I'm, I'm going to stop right there <laughs> and see if there are questions. There are none in chat. Okay. However, if anyone would like, if you raise your hand. Um, I, we can actually unmute you that way if you have a question. So I guess I can ask uh, some of you some questions. Um, in, in your experience, what I've said about these dynamics that are associated with collective trauma, are your members experiencing these in your workforce? Um, what kinds of things are you seeing people do with the uh, the, the stresses of the pandemic of uh, time out of the office. And then I don't know if you're back to work in a physical space yet. Um, so what's happening with you? Uh, well, I will take a stab at uh, trying to collect everyone's, but I, I, I assure you, I will probably only be getting about 10% of the impact. Um, we uh, are tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's the best word I can come up with it. Um, we've navigated over two and a half years of short staffing, of family members dying, getting sick, of bouncing in between all the regulations that the county has set, uh, trying to maintain those policies, making sure people are vaccinated, uh, educating them on what accommodations there are if they don't want to be, dealing with upset people because they lost jobs. So the, the our clientele we serve mm -hmm. are very impacted as far as, you know, losing jobs, losing houses, not knowing where to go, uh, mass resignations, people just realizing, you know, life is too short. And so the people that are left behind are just, it's almost so you're spinning. You're so overwhelmed and you have so much work, you don't know which way to go. Right. And, uh, and, and then you're trying to help everyone else. You know, we have our, our, our union is made up of, you know, where the, the meat in between this, you know, the bread and, um, it's hard, you know, you're trying to, to take care of yourself and you're trying to take care of everything at work. You're trying to take care of your employees, your your clients, your boss. Yeah. And uh, I think we've all lost a lot of ourself in that. We haven't been sharpening the, the saw, as Sorry. you say. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. And uh, when you're part of a, a collective trauma, um, I just used the phrase that I heard you say is we're trying to help. And and it can be depleted when you look around you and all you see is rubble um, and, and ruin. And say, oh my gosh, where do I start? Um, is there any point or you know, you know, how can I help? Uh, in um, one of the things I uh, suggest to people is, that they um, visualize that uh, as 
uh, you know, being in the midst of rubble and that you have a string and you tie it off one place, you pace over, you tie it off another place and you carve yourself out a square and you say, this square I can clean up, I can do something about. And, um, and, you, and you recruit other people um, to help you and to carve out their own space. Uh, to become task oriented in the, uh, in the context of, uh, of disaster is one of the hallmarks of being able to manage uh, in a very difficult situation. Um, so uh, in some ways, you're, um, you're compartmentalizing, uh, you're protecting yourself emotionally from the overwhelming nature of the, uh, all of the relational factors. Um, and um, the, it, uh, one of the most important things that you can do is simply acknowledge the state that you're in. Um, this recognition that um, our experience is an experience of collective trauma, and no wonder we would we would not even hesitate to think about that if it, if we were in the midst of an earthquake, for example, and things had fallen down all around us, and uh, we would be um, thought we, our thought process would be. Uh, that we'll get through this um, if we if we collectively engage in the process of cleaning up, of, you know, rescue. Or, um, but in the context that we're in, it's a different kind of a uh, collective trauma in that it's very difficult for us to see uh, the nature of the upset. Um, and uh, it is, um, I think in uh, the the speech I gave at OIT, I mentioned that this kind of upheaval is is like the 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 ground has rippled, you know, and we we have been shaken, and uh, it's as the more we can recognize that and realize also that we'll get through it, um, and that each of us has a role in getting through it, and we can choose to. Uh, uh, to uh, make the chaos worse, uh, or to sort, be the person who helps sort the chaos out, um, and um, do what it is that we can within the sphere of influence that we have. That's part of that balancing process around the, uh, the relational worldview. And I think that's probably the biggest struggle is we are all probably trying to sort the chaos out. Yeah. And yeah. we're we're all tired. So I think yes. I think collectively as uh, a union and peers, we probably need to do a little bit more uh, support for ourselves to remind yeah. ourselves that we're important enough to take that time, to take that breath, to go out in the nature. <laughs> well, and you, one of the most important uh, teachings I received uh, through my professional career. Uh, was that the, to learn that there's really only one cure for being tired. It's to rest. And uh, so uh, just, you know, and I, sometimes when I talk about that relational uh, model and you're looking at all four quadrants, the things that I suggest you do uh, seem inadequate to the task. Um, but collectively, they add up to, to healing. One of the most important things is to get enough sleep, get enough rest. Um, and because the taxing nature of the demands in a critical moment uh, deplete our energies in other parts of the circle, that then when that energy is depleted, uh, we can actually can, uh, perpetuate the damage um, in other, you know, in our relationships, uh, in our work, uh, uh, in various ways that if we allow things, um, you know, to fester or flare, we are um, in jeopardy of um, having the balance get worse um, and not be uh, mitigating the influence of the collective trauma.
We find that um, in our uh, in our tribal cultures, um, uh, in dealing with the historical trauma of colonialism, um, sometimes struggles internally when we can't fix the problem externally can cause us not. So you, you know, and I think in your case, you might see, for example. Uh, conflicts among staff um, that don't really make much sense, um, but they're there because of the nature of the collective trauma and no place for that to go and no agency to, uh, there's, there's, can't change something and we end up um, bumping into someone um, in, in the course of trying to be helpful. Uh, I think we have a hand raised, okay. uh, Carla. Uh, she's in a conference room, so I'm not sure who has the, the question, but uh, go ahead, Carla, or whoever had the question. Um, it's Teresa Castellanos. And uh, I would add, mm -hmm. hi, everybody. I would also add, we were also disaster workers. So many yeah. times we were the person telling you have COVID. We talked to people as they cried. Mm -hmm. We dealt with the... Uh, shooting that happened in VTA and just all the layers of it and not being taken care of by our employer when our employer was making us do this work yeah. and not even preparing us because I was not trained as a social worker, not trained as a post responder, not trained as a therapist. And then you get to burnout and I yeah. can understand balance before I get to burnout. But once you're burned out, how do you begin to take those steps? And I think a lot of us as county employees are in that space of extreme burnout. And then by that time, it's really hard to figure out how do I begin to heal? Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate this conversation. Well, uh, th thank you for the question. Um, one of the most important lessons in my professional career was uh, to learn about the concept of burn through rather than burn out. With the, with, uh, the appropriate help, uh, we can burn through. In other words, you know, fire tempers. Uh, fire makes people stronger, as it does with. Uh, but it, how you do that, uh, makes all the difference uh, between whether you become sharp or you become brittle. Um, and uh, and so the reason, for example, that we have um, that we we help people with. Uh, debriefing, uh, you know, uh, trauma, traumatic events. So uh, the reason that we get clinical uh, supervision when we're interacting with people, these are all things. And my um, my sense is, if you are not able to get that through your employer, uh, if you can seek it out in other places, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in a you know, seeking therapy as long as you find a support group or, you know, as we talked about earlier in Zeb's question, um, you know, when is it appropriate to seek out, uh, you know, uh, professional help versus uh, a self-help group? Um, all of them are legitimate. Um, uh, and it's that recognition of, oh my gosh, I'm here. And if I don't do something about it, uh, and, and it may be that you have to uh, get out of that space that's toxic um, uh, in order to get into that recovery process. Uh, but there's an awful lot that you can do uh, moment to moment, day to day. Uh, and I'm going to suggest a few of those in just a, just a moment here. And I see that I'm running low on time. Thank you for that question. Great, great question. Um, let's, because um, I want to make sure I share with you the uh, some strategies for trauma recovery. And you probably are all well aware of the concept of mindfulness. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a second. Our social supports are so important, either formal or informal, uh, whatever faith practices you have, um, spending time. Um, making sure that you are uh, practicing whatever uh, fills you up from a spiritual sense. 
and whatever your cultural teachings are about how to retain um, your well-being. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, um, and I'm going to suggest a plan for intentional resilience. So with mindfulness, just in a very thumbnail sketch, you set aside some time in a quiet space and you get comfortable and ob just observe the present moment as it is. You let your thoughts and judgments roll by. And we're um, the uh, supposedly the only creatures who have the ability to observe our own thoughts. And when we sit back and observe those thoughts, we can get some sense of what is uh, chaotic uh, and what is uh, restful. And uh, as we observe ourselves in the present moment, uh, it has a calming uh, effect that allows us to feel some sense of agency because we may not be able to control what's going on around us. Um, but if when we feel that sense of being able to control what we feel and how we respond to what's going on around us, we have a greater sense of agency. So be kind to your wandering mind, they say, and simply come back to uh, observing. Don't feel like um, it's not working. Uh, if you're sitting and you're observing your own thoughts, then it is working. Um, it, and you, uh, the more you practice it, the more benefit that you get from it. And uh, by, on the way, notice any shifts in your sense of well-being. Um, the two seconds that you feel a sense of well-being is better than the whole day you don't. Um, so uh, don't feel like uh, it isn't um, enough if you just even get a, a few seconds of feeling, ah, I just feel good for this second, for this, this five second period, I feel okay. Um, it's, uh, it's worth the effort. Uh, a strategy for supporting peers at work, um, and you're all in positions where you have the power to, imp um, to empower other people, where you're uh, providing people with motivation or asking them to innovate, uh, asking them to participate in solutions and problem solving, where you're inspiring people to, uh, to help uh, others through this very difficult time. The more you engage and recruit allies, uh, the, and I call it giving away the problem. Uh, when people are, um, are suffering and they have the capacity to give voice, to give voice to the things that hurt, um, they're valuable in uh, coming up with solutions. So as if you're a manager and somebody is saying to you, I'm getting burned out, um, you know, uh, figure out what would it look like if you were getting the this, this space that you need uh, to, to uh, heal that to, or the support that you need to burn through to get stronger and better um, and to be appreciative of the um, strengths that they bring to the work. You're recognizing their strengths and you can also teach other people this notion of intentional resilience, that it's not a silver bullet uh, linear approach. There is no one thing that you can do to alleviate all of the things that, are, that people struggle with, but you can do something in each of these areas um, uh, in, in a very intentional way. Here are some tribal teachings that are designed to keep uh, people healthy around this circle and thought to heal trauma. Now, they, they, uh, if you sorted them around the four quadrants, you'd find they, they fit in each of the four quadrants. But it's, uh, it's, the, it's ways that we organize our relationships with people and with our environment uh, culturally that allow us to keep strong in times of adversity. Um, showing respect for people, uh, operating from an attitude of, of gratitude, uh, having generation, we have a lot of ceremonies in which uh, 
we give gifts uh, and we make sure that uh, that we take care of relationships through gifting, uh, conducting ourselves with humility, uh, knowing that we're limited. Uh, my illustration of carving off what you can um, and doing what you can in the space that you have. Realizing that adversity takes courage, um, that what heals us is loving connections. Um, and you will hear a lot of people using gallows humor. Humor is a very healing um, process when we're in this, uh, this state. Having compassion for others, uh, forgiveness for others, practicing our spirituality, um, practicing our culture, taking time with elders uh, or people who, are, who we know who've been through adversity, who can reassure us. Uh, uh, providing service, not just in your work, but being service in your community, some social activity, and spending time and ceremony and ritual, whatever that is. So, um, and I think before I leave this slide, um, I want to just say that um, I was doing this presentation, not actually not too far from you as a tribe in in California, and in the audience was a gentleman who had served in the, um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and was uh, struggling with post traumatic stress. and And I was talking about this process of healing uh, using these four quadrants, and and how important it is to do something every day. And his he asked raised his hand, and asked me a question. He said. Uh, uh, how many does it take? And I said, uh, can you say more you know, about your question? He said, you, you, you're talking about doing this, uh, you know, things in each quarter. How much does it take? And I said, oh, it really only takes one. And his, I, he sat back and his eyes opened wide. And I said, but we don't know which one. Because that's how balance works. If you've ever had a balance scale and you added to one side and the, or the other, it tips with the last thing you put on. Um, so it is the uh, accumulated value of all of these various things that you do. It can be this, it can be as simple as the smile of a small child. Uh, who lifts your spirit because they smiled at you. It can be a question from a, your child or your grandchild who uh, makes you laugh, or it can be the, uh, the, the, the smell of a food that uh, is comforting to you when you walk in the house um, and you suddenly realize you feel this moment of relief or joy and you know you're at the point of balance. That I, uh, it is quite, you know, it is possible to me to feel this, and it's my intentionality is to have more and more and more of that every day, uh, by all of the small things that I do, how I schedule my time, who I choose to spend my time with, how I uh, choose to apply the gifts that I have to helping others. These, this is how the balance process works. Um then, so I want to just um, finish with this last, uh, there's a last couple of slides here. Uh, for a takeaway, I'd encourage you to come up with an intentional resilience plan for yourself. Choose one or two things in each of the quadrants, uh, things that are possible for you to do, um, maybe as simple as uh, a hot bath and your favorite food, uh, a bit of uh, mindfulness or meditation or, or attending some kind of ceremony or service. Uh, it could be hanging out with uh, your peer group or seeing people that you haven't seen for a while, uh, being uh, in a context where, of people who you know appreciate you. It may be um, sitting down with a good book, uh, maybe sitting down with uh, some wisdom literature um, and uh, choosing to do those things on a disciplined, intentional way. Put them in your calendar uh, and, uh, and just begin practicing that uh, as you move through this, a period of recovery 
from collective trauma. I want to share with you in our last couple of minutes. Um, in, in our uh, Haudenosaunee culture, we uh, have a lot of legends and stories. One of my favorite is the secret of No Face. And this is No Face is a, a corn husk doll. Um, she's, this is one that I made with my grandson. And he likes the stories of, and it's a, uh, the corn husk doll legend and secret of no face is about eight hours of telling and it kind of comes in chapters. And he particularly likes the chapter where uh, this, and for one of her names is Wahayenta. It means she knocks the dew off. And because she's only about four or five inches tall and she runs through the grass. And when she runs through the grass, it knocks the dew off the grass. It makes her friend Chuckle Snaps the turtle kind of upset because that's where he drinks from. And, and, and they have kind of this loving but cheeky relationship with one another. Um, you notice that um, Wahayenta um, has a, a black and white necklace. This is given to her in a ceremony as somebody who was helping her on her epic uh, journey to find her face. And um, when she was given this necklace, um, because she was just about to embark on this hero's journey um, that, uh, where she would face many obstacles, the, uh, the person that uh, is referred into the, in the story as Blind Maiden, and, gave her the necklace and Wahayenta says, why is the necklace black and white? And, and Blind Maiden said, because the, the white beads represent those things that are, that uh, will help you on your journey. Uh, the things, the things that will lift you up, uh, that uh, where uh, someone uh, will do something for you that helps or things or circumstances that will make your journey easier. The dark beads, those are for the things that the challenges that you're going to face. The people who will um, try to disrupt your journey or bring you harm. Um, and Wahayanta looks at the necklace and she says, um, there's a necklace in the middle here that's half black and half white. And Blind Maiden says, well, all of life is like this. All of life is uh, a series of events, of things that lift you up and things that challenge you. This bead that's half black and half white, it's there because some of the things that uh, you will experience will start out looking good. And um, some, and we, turn out bad and some will start out looking bad but turn out good but only your discernment can tell you the difference so i would ask you to remember to practice your intentional resilience um, and this is my mother who passed on a few years ago and my grandson who um is now 11 almost 12 years old and who still makes me laugh every time I am with him. So he's part of my intentional resilience. And I see we're out of time. That's okay. Thank you so much, Terry. We are truly so grateful and honored you're able to join us today and speak about this topic. Uh, before we sign off, um, our PD committee member, Teresa Chigoya, would like to share some resources with everyone. Uh, Teresa? Teresa, are you there? Oh, I'm here. Okay. Here we go. Yay. I didn't turn it on. Thank you so much for the talk, <laughs> Terry. I think um, I'm going to try and share my screen real quick so that you're able to see um, some of uh, those who don't know me, Teresa Shigoya. I am with our employee wellness division. Um, and really, um, as Terry had mentioned, there's a lot of ways that we would be like to support you and your intentionality. Um, and let me see if I can get this going here for my share screen. Um, there we go. Um, there we go. Are we able to see the screen? 
Yes, yes, we see it. Thank you. Perfect. Teresa. Perfect. So um, this is our take time campaign that we are currently running and it really is around some of the things that Terry did talk about taking time for various areas in your uh, personal well being to to take time to do. There's four areas or five areas I'm sorry that we're focusing on emotional well being social which I know you were talking about specifically nutrition your financial and then your physical health and. Um, we're currently running the campaign, have some really amazing support for you and for your staff or your teams. Um, and each of these tabs we are launching weekly. We have uh, a couple of them already launched um, and have curated resources for you. There's a stress profiler um, that can help you figure out specific areas that might you won't want to focus on with resources. We have re a bunch of uh, relaxation classes and I'll pop that up for you. Um, specifically wanted to draw attention to, we have a sound healing class that is helping at the hospitals and then some other ones that are coming up um, that are about refresh, refresh, I'm sorry, refreshing, replenishing your mind. So hopefully you'll be able to participate in some of those. Um, and lastly, if specific to the emotional well-being, if you do find yourself in crisis, there are um, a myriad of resources and folks you might be able to reach out to either by text, by phone, by chat, whatever um, might be helpful to you. Um, in addition, we do have the social support we just launched this week, a way to recognize your coworkers, to share and inspire. inspire to find folks who are uh, like-minded. If you wanna go to parks, if there's some things at the library, there's all kinds of ways that you can engage socially to helpfully uh, refresh your, um, your yourself around that. Um, we have nutrition coming up next week, financial and physical. So hopefully there's some great resources that you might be able to participate and help yourself um, and your teammates during this time so that we can address uh, the emotional well-being and the mental health of our uh, of ourselves. So thank you for that time. Thank you so much, Teresa. Again, thank you so much, Terry, and also to Donna for bringing Terry to us. Uh, again, a thank you to the PD committee members and the SEMA executive board for the support and of course our SEMA OE3 staff. But most of all, thank you to all of you, our SEMA members for attending, for continuing to strive to continue learning and developing and improving professionally. We know you're all busy, so we truly appreciate you spending your precious time with us. Apologize, apologies that we are a few minutes over, but thank you so much for attending our event today. Hope you have a great rest of the week and a great weekend coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lawrence, I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay, thank you so much, Zeb. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you.